You say that you are now concerned about inflation, you think there's something important going on here, but you don't think that this is like going back to the 70s and 80s. Why are those parallels flawed? Well, the 1970s, they really were a quite extraordinary period. Uh, in particular, you've got to look at the history. I mean, whenever I'm thinking about economic issues, that's what I do. I look at the history. And the fact of the matter is you'd had quite a long period before then of persistent inflation, not very high, but persistent inflation, and it was storing up some problems. Then you had the breakdown of the fixed exchange rate system, the Bretton Woods system, and a period of chaos. And you had expansionary monetary policies. The monetary authorities really behind the curve, not taking, not paying enough attention, I think, to the inflationary danger. And then, of course, you had the oil price surge. You had two oil price surges, actually, in the 1970s. Uh, 73, 4 being the first one. And that uh, drove prices higher. Uh, I think this is a, a very different situation. And I don't think we're going to get inflation anything like as high as it was then. But I do believe that there is now a significant inflationary danger. So, so give us some thoughts as to why you think that is then, Roger. Why do you see that inflationary danger? Because some of the things that you talked about in the past and other economists have cited as to reasons we saw a low inflation period are still there. We still have globalisation of certain industries. We still have price discovery by technology, by Amazon, for example. We still have perhaps reduced uh, wages, bargaining power uh, for trade unions relative to certainly the 70s. So why do you, why do you think then that we are going to see a, a real inflation push? Well, in some ways, this um, is quite amusing, at least to me, because when I wrote that book, The Death of Inflation, uh, what I had to say was really very unorthodox indeed. In fact, lots of people, lots of central banks uh, said I was talking nonsense because I was putting a lot of stress upon these supply side factors that you've mentioned and in particular the, the rise of China. And what I said was that I thought these factors were going to unleash a series of price cuts and intense price competition, which was going to make the old wage price spiral difficult to get going and indeed was going to suppress it. That's what I said then. And I think, broadly speaking, uh, that's pretty much how things panned out. But I always was aware of the power of monetary policy and the power of demand. I never put that uh, to one side. Uh, and what's happened now, it's, it seems to me the orthodoxy has been completely overturned. Now the orthodoxy seems to be, oh, uh, money supply doesn't matter, uh, stance of policy doesn't matter, you've got all these cost reductions and you've got competition. I find all this terribly funny because, you know, okay. there's been globalisation in Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Turkey, and all the other countries that have had quite rapid inflation uh, over the last several years. Now, when it comes to it, it's... The stance of monetary policy, the build-up of these big uh, money balances in the hands of households, the stance of fiscal policy, the very low interest rates, I think this is what really makes this a particularly dangerous period. So that's the driver then. It's the, it's the monetary and the fiscal policy that, that you cite there, Roger. What about climate policy? Is that something that's going to add some inflationary pressure? We've certainly heard that from a couple of voices so far. Mm. I think that's right. And it's not that... Um, uh, I think that the supply factors uh, and institutional factors aren't relevant in the current setup. I think they are. You rightly pointed out a moment ago that some of the forces that held inflation back before are still very much there. They are, although I think that there's a, a, a waning. Um, and in particular, what's going on at a global level, we may not have the tariff war that people talked about before, but I think you can begin to see signs of... Um, the world having to make a choice between China and the US, I think it's going to bifurcate between two groups, two rival groups, uh, and that is going to lead to cost increases. Uh, and I do think that the moves against climate change are going to lead to substantial increases in, in costs. Now, if you put all this together, although it's not on the scale of the 1970s and in the slightest, I think you've got quite a worrying combination because when people see prices going up, and they're aware that interest rates are terribly low um, and their expectations are not necessarily anchored and the monetary authorities are not saying, you know, you better watch out because we're going to be raising interest rates pretty soon, then I think this comes to be quite a nasty combination. That can be a nasty combination. And thinking about the role that we see here for oil prices, this, you know, we've already established, uh, going back to the 70s might not be all that helpful. But can, do you see a period, given climate policy, do you see a period, it's possible we get underinvestment in oil during the transition, and that has the potential to drive inflation as we transition away from oil towards other sources of energy? Is that something we need to be uh, putting into the mix as well, Roger? 
I suppose that's possible, yeah. It's not, frankly, uppermost in my mind um, when I'm thinking about the various dangers. Yeah, I think it's it's certainly a possible factor. Uh, in the background, there's something else that I think is really very important indeed, which is the, 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 the influence of demographics, which is not going to, admittedly, determine what happens to inflation on a month-by-month -month or even a year-by-year -year basis. But we have... Um, moving out now, I think, of a quite extraordinary period where there was a big surge in the labour force um, driven by China, but not only, only about China. And now, of course, that's falling in China and it's falling in a number of other countries as well. This is what I'm more concerned about. The oil factor you rightly draw attention to is one of those things that can lead to a spike in prices uh, and costs, which is worrying. But I think this factor about demographics is a much more powerful and long-lasting background factor. Let me just ask you finally then, Roger, about the role that wages play and what you see here, because some people suggest that wage is the important link in determining just how uh, long-standing this spike in inflation is going to be, how it will embed itself. I wonder if that's what you're watching. Do you think news coverage, the conversations we're having right now, also has a role to play in inflation expectations? I mean, we've got a chart that shows just how much coverage there's been of inflation in recent uh, days and weeks, which is, uh, which is quite interesting, shows a sudden spike upwards. What is it that you think turns a temporary blip into something that's more entrenched? Well, I've always thought that um, with regard to inflation and indeed deflation, psychological factors play a very large role. Of course, they're very difficult to forecast or an anticipate. Um, but you put your finger on it. I think wages hold the key here. It'll be some time before we know the answer to this. But I think within a couple of years, I think it is as long as that, we'll know whether the surge in prices is just a one-off increase in the price level effectively and is not going to lead to continuing inflation or whether it's going to get passed through the system. Um, and my guess is there will be a bit of that. So I expect inflation to settle at a higher level than we've seen it recently. And the wages will be the key thing I will be watching.